Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast, now part of the Believe Network. And with the passing of legendary Rockets voice, Gene Peterson, I wanted to pay tribute to Gene and welcome back a couple of friends of the show. Most of you should remember Greg Lucas from his years on the Astros broadcast, but back in the early 80s, he was on the Rockets broadcast. Also with us is Robert Falkoff a Rockets beat writer from 1980 to 95, an author of two books, including Rudy T's bio, all about the Rockets of, of those era and that era. Welcome back to the show, guys. And, and I want you to start off with Gene Peterson, the person. Robert, let me start with you. Uh, what do you remember about Gene, the person? Yeah, I go way back with Gene. Um, when I came on the beat in 1979, Gene had been... Uh, had been there, I think, since 75. So he kind of uh, took me under his wings. We uh, we didn't get off to that great a start uh, because he was so fiercely loyal to the Rockets. And I think he kind of wanted to test me out, to, you know, to see, was I going to be fair? Was I going to be, uh, you know, the kind of person that was fair to the Rockets, but not, not a homer, but just did the job, you know, day in and day out. He felt like I did, and I think it took, after a year or so, we became really good friends, hung out together on the road a lot. Uh, I got to know his his family. I remember his kids um, growing up, and he would always be talking about their school activities and so forth. He loved Kingwood. When he said when he saw it for the first time, yeah, I remember him telling me it was just, you know, he felt like that was heaven on earth. And even though I thought, well, how, how can you drive so far to get into the summit, you know, for games? But he was willing to do that because he thought it was just an ideal place to, to raise a family. As time went on, um, you know, I knew him from, we did a segment, a pregame show. The Post had a, a, a sponsorship. And so we would do that for several years. Uh, he, we would usually tape it uh, at the hotel be, before going to the arena. And then we would sit around and talk for a while. And so I got to, got to know him even better that way. My thoughts on him as a broadcaster is that he was from the Harry Carey School of Broadcasting. Gene was a fan of the Rockets. The way he called the game would not have worked in national radio or TV. You have to be impartial. He was the guy sitting in the bar with the fans pulling for the Rockets, and he would actually ref the game as he was calling the game. I mean, he would, you know, Harper's got the ball. He walks, no call. I mean, you know, he would just throw that in. Uh, he would ref it as he was going, and I think that endeared him because the fans, you know, they were right there with him. He wanted to win. They wanted to win. That's kind of what I, what I remember about his, his broadcasting style. He was the life of the uh, life of the party on the road. He would always plan dinners on days off. You know, he loved to go out and eat on a, on a night off, and you know, bring all the media or have all the media get together. And just just a fun guy all around and when Jim Foley came on and they were partners they had such a great time golf in the morning come back get a shower get some lunch you know go to the arena and call the game I mean that was a perfect day a perfect day for him and so just so many great memories um, I saw on social media yesterday a lot of people talked about the 1994 Western Conference Finals when I don't even remember the scorekeeper's name, but it was Wayne Hicken was his name. And yeah, hold your hold and, your thoughts on, hold your thoughts okay. on that because I want to get I want to get to that in a little bit. But Greg, okay. uh, what do you remember about Gene the person? Well, I was uh, of course competition with him a little bit because uh, when I came in, that was just when the Rockets started to do a lot of television. Prior to me coming in, Bill Worrell had done some games, but he had done them on Channel 39, and they only televised like 20, 25 games a year. But the next year, when uh, when uh, HSE was born and Channel 20 came on the scene, that was a brand new station, the plan was to televise a lot more games. Actually, it wasn't going to be all 81 at that time. It was going to be about 50, but that was doubling the amount. And as it worked out within the three years that I did games, we got to the point where we did every game home and road. Usually the road games were over-the-air television with Channel 20. And the uh, home games were all on the HSE. The theory being that the cable penetration uh, was not as great as uh, over the air was. So that was not going to hurt the home crowd as much. But Gene was, we were, so we were a little bit of competition. And in fact, uh, one year after I left, 
uh, after I was uh, moved out to do college sports and Warrell came back after being gone for three years, they actually used a simulcast and that got Gene on television. That didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was pretty much because of what Bob was talking about, Mr. Falkoff, that uh, he liked to referee the games and call the games and everything else. And some of that got exposed by the video. As a matter of fact, Warrell, who was technically his analyst on those games, had a tough time when they did replays because quite often the replays proved that what Gene had been saying wasn't even right, but the picture proved it. And so they only did that one year. They did the simulcast one year. And then after that, Bill started doing both home and road and he had Calvin as his partner. And that was the way it was for a long time. But that was also about the time that uh, Gene and uh, got Foley as his partner, because prior to that, he had pretty much been doing radio by himself, like most of the NBA announcers were at the time. And Gene was colorful, as I think the comparison to the Harry Carey style works, because he was very, very colorful, as we all know. Three-pointer, Maxwell, yeah! He came up with pet phrases that stuck. Uh, he was excited. And you'll still see some of his highlights. So they'll still run occasionally those highlights on 790 radio when they're doing rocket promos. Some of them will still show up. Uh, so, no, he was a unique announcer. He was a great announcer for a team. And as uh, Robert says, he wouldn't have been a network type guy because he wasn't neutral enough. I'm not sure how much he paid attention really to the players on the other team, not to the extent of Johnny Most in Boston, who didn't even know who they were. Uh, Gene was better than that. But uh, he was definitely Rockets all the way. And, and certainly he will always be remembered as, uh, for those who do remember him, as a great voice of Houston Rocket basketball. Before we started recording, Greg, you told me how Gene got hired. You, you've heard this story before. Can you tell that? Well, he had been uh, the, the first announcer for the Rockets was a guy named Art Ekman. He had actually been with them in San Diego and he came with them in Houston to Houston. Uh, at that point, Gene was working for KPRC radio as uh, just a sports guy, news guy, whatever. He had a career that started him like many radio guys in one town, another town, native of Minnesota, but he'd been all over in various places. He got to be knowing uh, Ray Patterson pretty well because he'd been covering the team. And Ekman was not living in Houston at the time. And so what happened one off season, uh, Ray just decided, Peterson, you're going to be my new voice of the Rockets. The Rockets. And Ekman, Ekman didn't even know that yet at the time, but he got the word. And something similar had happened to Ekman in San Francisco, one of the other cities he had worked, when uh, the San Francisco station all of a sudden decided that they were bringing in Al Michaels uh, to be on the Giants crew. Ekman had been on the Giants crew the year before, and all of a sudden he was replaced. So he had a long career, by the way, Art Ekman, uh, out of Atlanta, and he did a lot of motor sports. Uh, he was in the business for over 50 years. He had a great voice. But in two occasions, because he did not live in the city for who he announced, that axed him. For Peterson, it worked out great. 33 years as the voice of the Rockets, and I think no uh, no Rocket fan is upset with that at all. Oh, no, not, no way. And, and just a quick reminder to our audience that I also want to ask you guys your favorite Gene Peterson memories. Put it in the YouTube comments. Click the like button and subscribe to support the show. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And guys, you said it. Uh, Peterson style, of course, straight up Rockets fan. He was yelling at officials for missing calls or getting frustrated when the team wasn't playing well. The Jazz playoff game, uh, Robert was mentioning earlier, it's now legend Gene's call. Start the time clock. Start the time clock. Can you believe this? They haven't even started the clock. Uh, what, do, what do you remember about that game, Robert? And, and uh, what was your impression of, of his style? <laughs> uh, well, I was sitting behind Gene and Jim down. Uh, they had the media, the, the print media up above uh, where those guys were and the, they were down on the court. And so I had a good view of it. And, and what happened, the poor guy, he just got transfixed by the game. There were, I think, 14 seconds to go. Uh, the Rockets might have been up a point. Utah had the ball and they inbound and, it, you know, the clock doesn't start. They kept playing and playing and playing. And Gene and Jim are going crazy down there. Well, start the time clock. They're not even starting the clock. The clock. They didn't even start the clock. They, they haven't yet. even started the clock. They haven't yet. Finally, the Jazz still, they couldn't get a, get a, a shot off. They finally get a shot off. And after it seemed like an eternity, you know, they finally 
ended the game. He started the clock way, way, way late. Can you believe this? They haven't even started the clock. We got it anyway. We got it anyway. Take it in, take it in, take it in, take it in. Take it in, take it in. This Percy had come over, uh, the official. <laughs> These guys are, you know, they're screaming and they're yelling at him. And Jess Kersey goes, I used to respect you guys. I used to respect you guys. And Jim Foley said, no, 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 Jess, you don't understand. They didn't start the clock. That's when Jess kind of kind of dawned on him what had happened. And they went and got it straightened out. I mean, I don't know what would have happened had the Jazz scored way, way after the clock should have run out and won that game. It was Two to one at the time. The Rockets got that road win to go up three one. Eventually closed it out in five. But if the Jazz win that game, make it two two. Who knows? And I guess it was just. I mean, Gene didn't need much incentive to go off on you know whatever that the Rockets weren't getting a fair shake. <laughs> Certainly in that case, he was right. Of course, I wasn't listening to the broadcast, but I guess it was uh, uh, legendary. I saw so many comments on social media and pro uh, people yesterday talking about, oh, I remember when he said he didn't start the clock, they didn't start the clock, but it was wild if you were there uh, in person. It was certainly a, an epic moment in Rockets history. That's one of the things they do play occasionally on 790, and uh, so you can actually, if you wish, time it yourself to see how long it actually was, and it was a long time before they got that clock started. Well, you know, I, I went down and actually just stood in front of the score and he got mad at me. He goes, he looked up and I was just like, well, I was down here to see what's going on. And he said, I don't have to answer to you. And so I go, well, no, you don't. But uh, let's get this, uh, get this right. But anyway, it played out. The Jazz never got the ball in the basket. And so the Rockets had to play defense for way longer than they needed to to win that game. But they did and, and went home and closed the Jazz out, went on to the final. Well, as a kid growing up, I, I fell in love with the Rockets, mostly to Gene Peterson and Jim Foley on the radio. And we didn't have cable in those days. Only about half the games were televised over the air. So I'm in my bedroom in Sharpstown playing with my Nerf hoop and listening to those guys. Fast forward to the 94 championship run, and I'm going to school at the University of Missouri at this point, uh, as did Robert back earlier, much earlier than I did, but both Mizzou grads. But during the final minutes of Game 7, I call one of my best friends from high school, Anthony, who was one of the original co-hosts of Houston Sports Talk. And I said, turn up the radio because I had to hear Gene's emotion. And, you know, there's no way I could miss that particular how sweet it is, Greg and Robert. Just, I could. I'm like, I got to listen to Gene and Jim. This is what, how I got to get my final few minutes of the Rockets championship. Before that, a couple of years, I think it was a couple of years before that, Gene had bypass surgery and... Um, one of the things I, uh, I'm really proud of is that, I, you know, I got to go to the hospital and my dad had had bypass surgery. So I kind of knew the procedure of how you recover. You know, it's a day by day. You just feel a little bit better every day. And I just remember going to the hospital and Gene was there. And I, I just said, let me tell you my personal experience with my dad. You know, you, you're hurting so bad now but every day if you just get a little bit better eventually you know you'll be back to full speed i think that resonated with him i remember his family all being in the room and this is you know uh, i think maybe you know 91 or 92 but the fact that he, he made a full recovery he came back and he got to got to cover those championship years and you think about what might have been um with that serious surgery but fortunately everything at that time worked out for him Greg, as you know, when you're a broadcaster, it always helps to have that signature phrase. Everybody, of course, thinks of how sweet it is. But Gene's other one was backing it in, backing it in, backing it in, which made it kind of perfect since he got Moses, Akeem, Barkley, and Yao. <laughs> well, and, and 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 it's and the thing is, if you have a pet phrase, it's got it's got to be accurate, and that's accurate. That's exactly what was going on. In other words, your your whole point when you're doing radio is to paint the picture because nobody can see what's actually going on. You got to go geography. You got to go left side, right side, which you don't have to do in television, but you have to do it because nobody can see. They are listening to how you paint it and backing it in, backing it in is exactly what was happening at the time. And so, no, he was, uh, he was aware of that. He was conscious of that. A lot of our newer announcers, our younger guys who have worked in television first, 
don't translate well to radio because they don't under they don't understand that they get into a talk show or they get uh, and and believe me the fans don't know where the ball is or what's going on unless you tell them and gene would tell them craig ackerman said quote gene had the quintessential voice for broadcasting deep baritone everything you put in a textbook he checked all those boxes ackerman said peterson and foley should be in the hall of fame uh, what do you guys think? Should those guys be in the Hall of Fame? As far as Houston is concerned, certainly. And they were here as a team long enough, for that matter. And Foley was the media relations guy, too. So uh, I, I, as far as that, I think I'm big on longevity, having a lot to do with Halls of Fame. Some people say, what, well, you know, why? You know, why is Harold Baines in the Baseball Hall of Fame? Well, longevity was one of the reasons. And I think that's true with announcers, especially because if you aren't good you're not going to last. Now there's politics that can involve too, I and mean, your ownership changes and all that sort of stuff. But he survived ownership changes and he had a fan base that really loved him. That's Hall of Fame stuff as far as I, what I'm concerned. Yeah, he had the great voice and he had his style and, and he made it play. And as you say, Greg, if you're not good, you're not going to last. And he lasted 33 years. And in terms of the Houston Sports Hall of Fame, for sure, Texas Sports Hall of Fame, uh, and even the National Hall of Fame at some point, I think he's one of the best uh, radio guys that's come down the pike. So uh, I'll, he would get my vote. Now, I don't know. Do you know, does the Naismith Hall have any announcers? I don't know if they do. They have international players and stuff. But I'm not sure if they have announcers they, in that one. They have a media. They have a media. Okay, they do. They do. Yeah. Well, that, that, would, that would count. That would count. That would be certainly something that should be considered. Yeah, and before his 33 years with the Rockets, if people don't know it, you know, he just didn't start off there. He was with the South Dakota Jackrabbits, worked in Wisconsin, New Mexico, and Kansas City before he came to Houston as the sports director at KPRC. Bill Worrell said he was a big reason that people listen to the Rockets, his voice. I'd put it right up there with Milo Hamilton, his voices. You knew immediately who they were. He was a joy to work with. He and Jim, we were kind of the three musketeers out on the road. We traveled the world together. Um, just any final thoughts from you guys just uh, about Gene and, you know, his his career and, and Gene the person? Well, you mentioned the voice because he was one of those classic voices that actually came through uh, one of those how to be a broadcast school, not college or university. But that's because of the voice. But if you have the voice, you have to have something up here because just being able to talk maybe makes you a good booth announcer or something or a guy in commercials. But to, to be a play by play announcer in sports uh, you got to ad lib. You got to be able to describe things. And he did both very, very well for 33 years. Yeah, he did. And and, and, he, and he was a joy to be around away from the, the court, too. Um, <laughs> he used to do a, a funny thing. I thought Bill Fitch, when Bill Fitch was a coach, Bill was known for wearing a very strong cologne. And so when he would go to do the pregame show with Bill, he would walk down this long hall in the summit and Fitch's office was to the right, and he had to go down the other hall. So he would walk down to save some, uh, save his legs. He would just walk down to that intersection and sniff. And if he smelled the cologne, he would make a right turn and go down to Fitch's office and knock on the door. If he didn't smell the cologne, he just turned and walked away. And Not here yet. Later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gene's son, Todd, said his dad had become a huge Astros fan as well over the years, so much so that he, he had them put the Astros on TV in his final days in the hospital. And one of the coolest moments of my career is when I was working for the Rockets TV broadcast. They asked me to do a feature on Gene and Jim. I'm going to put the link of that feature at the end of this. If you're watching it on YouTube, if you're not, just go over to the YouTube, go towards the end of the video and you'll find it. And just want to thank you guys again, Robert and Greg, for sharing the memories. And I've just got to finish up by quoting Gene's longtime partner, Jim Foley. I, I feel like there's no other way to end this because those guys were so tied at the hip. And he put it best when he said, quote, as Gene always said, it was family, God and the Rockets. And he lived by all of those. How sweet it was, Gino. He's got, oh, he's got Elijah one. Back to Maloney. Maloney turns. Eddie at the buzzer. Yeah! Listening to Houston Sports Talk.
Hey, don't forget to support us by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. You can always listen to us on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends about us and share our show links on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.